What's public health trying to do? It is trying to fulfill society's interest in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy. And, and this is a statement from the Institute of Medicine, the Future of Public Health Report in 88. They've done a more recent one as well. But these were considered sort of definitive statements about what public health is. The aim of public health is to generate organized community effort to address the public interest in health by applying scientific and technical knowledge to prevent disease and promote health. Great definition. It's missing one of the most important parts of public health that we'll be talking a lot about today. And that's the politics of it. The art of the politics that go into public health. But otherwise, this is a real good definition. The Institute of Medicine said that there are three core functions to public health. Assessing the health of the population. Assessing the health of the population by itself does not do anything immediately for health, but it can pay off big time in the short term and sometimes even the much longer term. The development of public health policies and the assurance of the availability of needed services. And now I want to look at each one of these individually. Okay, assessment of the public's health. Data collection, statistical epidemiologic analysis, dissemination of findings. What does this sound like? This is biostatistics and epidemiology, basically. There are other fields that are involved in this as well. But this is data collection. And it turns out that monitoring what's going on with people's health is enormously important for a variety of reasons. Understanding what's a problem and what is not a problem. <coughs> Observing what's an emerging problem or one that maybe is disappearing or reducing in magnitude. Trying to figure out the connections between individual behaviors, individual circumstances, and community circumstances, the environment, and so on, and health outcomes. These are all terribly important, and really the core science, if you will, in public health. Then comes development of public health policies. This requires two things neither of which is necessarily easy, and putting them together is extremely difficult. One of them is having a good scientific knowledge base. We are I'm, I'm working with the problem right now with a bunch of colleagues, what's referred to as the tobacco end game, trying to figure out how we go further than we have to date in dealing with tobacco problems because things have kind of leveled off over the last several years, not only in the U.S., but in many other countries. Smoking has been just kind of flat. It's not going down at the rate people hoped, and smoking remains our leading cause of premature death and disability. So we're trying to figure out, what can we do about that? Figuring out the nature of the problem requires science. Dealing with some of the proposed end game strategies requires lots of science. Understanding what impacts they would be likely to have is really a challenge. But here's the other piece of it. We have to be active and effective in the political process. You can have all the science in the world, and in an area that is driven by collective action, public sector action, if you don't have good politics, you don't have good public health. This is tough. Why is it tough? There are very few people who are good at both of these, and you have to figure out somebody to bring them together. If you, if you talk to all the faculty in this school, you would find a handful who have been really active at the political level in dealing with whatever health problem they're concerned with. Just a handful of them. But a lot of them would have worked with people who are lobbyists, public health lobbyists and others, whose entire life is devoted to the political process. And they're trying to get the knowledge that we can create in this school into the political system. And by the way, I mean politics both big P and little p. So big P is what I'm asking you to do to go register so you can vote. That's getting out there and electing people. Little p is being good within the office context at working with your colleagues to get them to move in the directions that you think are important. And a lot of public health doesn't require votes of Congress or a state legislature or the Ann Arbor City Council. A lot of public health goes on inside the bureaucracy. Somebody has to make a decision in the Environmental Public Health Agency. Somebody has to decide uh, what we're going to do at Washtenaw County Health Department. 
And frequently there is a lot of political lobbying of one's colleagues to make those things happen. Putting these together is tough, but it's essential for effective public health. Here's one that's a little bit more complicated to understand and maybe even more difficult to do, and that's this idea of assurance. Public health as a field is, at least in theory, responsible for making sure that all people get the services that they need. Okay? Now, hopefully most of them get it through the marketplace. Most of us get our health care through uh, insurance that we have through employment, uh, or we pay for some of it out of pocket. It's not a big deal, and well, it's a big deal in terms of the money that's going into it, but it's something the market's working okay for some number of people, for a large number of people. But there are other people where that's, that's not the case. Uh, the new Obamacare law is going to address a significant portion of them. Not all of them, but a significant proportion of them. What does public health do? It can encourage appropriate action by other entities, so it can encourage hospitals to take uh, more charity care, for example. Uh, it can require such actions through law or regulation, and in fact, that's how we deal with charity care in many communities. Hospitals are required to allow a certain number of people in who can't pay for their care and to cover that. And by the way, the hospital doesn't cover it. We cover it through our health insurance premiums, our taxes. They all go up because we get charged more in the hospital to cover those cases that aren't compensated. And another way is to directly provide services. And it turns out if you go into any health department in the nation, maybe not any, that's too big a statement, most, and certainly all large health departments, you'll find that a very large proportion of what they're spending their money on is providing services to people who cannot afford to get them otherwise. Now, there are a lot of people in public health who think that's a shame because they're taking the scarce public health resources and devoting it to something that we would rather have the existing organizations that are there to provide those services provide to those people. All right, there are 10 essential public health services. I'm going to uh, invite you to read these on your own so I don't have to read them to you. Uh, if you have any questions about this, and again, this comes from the Institute of Medicine study, but if you have any questions about this, please ask either me or your GSI about any of them. Okay? Five core areas of public health, and it just so happens they correspond to the five departments in this school. Whatever school of public health you go to, you'll find slightly different organization, organizational structures. You will find each one of these being offered in every school of public health because every one of them is central to the field. Here we've just divvied up our, our structure basically. It means we have other little organizations that interact with them, but basically we have five departments that correspond to these five fields. So what are they? Epidemiology, you're going to hear about this uh, another week or so uh, from the former chair of the Department of Epidemiology and now our senior associate dean uh, who's going to tell you what epidemiology is all about. It is concerned with analyzing and describing patterns of occurrence and determinants of diseases in human populations. And as I've noted before, it really is kind of the core science of the field of public health. What's that a picture of in the upper left? It's a water pump, but it's a very specific one. Any ideas? Uh, back there. The Broad Street Pump. This may be the most famous water pump in history. You're going to actually see some charts about how Jon Snow worked to figure out how to stop an outbreak of cholera, I think it was in 1854, if I recall, in London, before anybody had any idea what caused cholera. Nobody knew what it was. They had no idea the microbes, bugs, anything involved in disease in those days. And he sat down, and he, he's really he's called the father of epidemiology because he did what epidemiologists now do. He made a map of all the houses, all the dwellings within the immediate area, and he put a dot on each one where there was a case of cholera. And lo and behold, they all were centered right around this pump. He went out and removed the pump handle. And lo and behold again, the epidemic stopped. 
he solved the problem without having any idea how the disease was transmitted. And by the way, one of the things we're going to see later on in this course, that's a very common story in public health. I'll show you some data that will illustrate that our biggest successes against tuberculosis preceded any knowledge of what caused it, preceded any treatment for it, or any preventives to avoid it. You'll see how we did that uh, earlier in history. And uh, as I say, we will, I'll go through that with you. But this story is a wonderful story because the guy was just using his smarts. He was kind of like thinking like a mystery writer or a detective or something and said, well, wait a minute. If there's a pattern here, it must mean something. Now, by the way, just because he figured it out and he stopped it doesn't mean that the community, that the government went along with him. They eventually did put the pump handle back, but that epidemic had passed at that stage. They didn't believe what he had done had worked, and it took quite a while to establish that this is effective science and that it was very meaningful science. So you'll learn more about that in the epidemiology lecture and maybe even beyond. Biostatistics. It's a simple way to put this. Statistics applied to public health and biomedical research. So biostatisticians are statisticians. They are focusing on issues related to health. I mentioned biomedical research because such an essential ingredient in biomedical research is statistics. And by the way, I, just out of curiosity, how many of you are pre-meds? I suspect it's quite a few. Yeah. Uh, I urge you, I don't know whether this is required for medical school these days or not, I urge you to learn some statistics. You're not going to get enough of it in medical school, and I can't tell you how many huge blunders have been made in the field of medicine because doctors don't understand statistics. And there's some very famous cases of it. This won't happen now in, in the prominent medical journals, all of which have biostatistical consultants. Every study that goes through New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, uh, BMJ, Lancet, any of those, every study that goes through there for review is going to have a statistical, professional statistical review. But there were cases, I remember one in particular, where some guy had nine cases, uh, five of whom responded to a treatment, and all of a sudden this became the treatment of choice in medical care. People adopted it widely, and it didn't work. It just had to do with the random element that occurs occasionally because people don't understand statistics. Uh, I'll give you my favorite example. I won't mention any names because it would be far too embarrassing. Um, one of my own little medical episodes, I uh, had a bad back, still do occasionally, but I uh, had a bad back while I was in my 40s and I was getting spasms a lot. Uh, and at one point my doc said, I think you ought to go to an orthopedic surgeon to have it checked out. And I said, why? because I'm not ready for surgery. This is not something I want to think about. And he said, oh, just do it for baseline. Let's you know, figure out what's going on. So I went to this orthopedic surgeon who happens to be, or was, I don't know if he's still here, a tenured professor in the Department of Surgery here at the University of, Medicine, of Michigan, a tenured professor. And he said, all right, let's get an MRI to see what your back looks like. And I said, do we really need to do that? You know, why? Because I'm, I'm not going to have surgery. I'm not even thinking about it now. And he said something like baseline, you know, just get the background information, see what's going on. So I went and had the MRI, uh, knowing, of course, it wasn't going to cost me anything. It was $1,400. Didn't come out of my pocket. It came out of the university's insurance coverage, meaning that I imposed a, a, probably a 20-cent penalty on everybody in the University of Michigan healthcare insurance package or something like that because it gets spread out over everybody. So I go and I have the uh, MRI done. I come back for a follow-up visit and he puts up a picture on the view box and there's this picture of the spine. It looks just fine except there's this giant bulging disc and the radiologist has drawn an arrow in red crayon pointing at the bulging disc. And he says to me, well everything looks fine. You don't have a disc related problem. So, now I'm not a doctor, I, but I was looking at this large bulging disc with the arrow. I said, excuse me, what is that large bulging disc with the arrow pointing at it? And his response, and I swear to God this is verbatim, his response is, oh, that's L3, L4. L4, L5 is where 90% of the disc-related back problems occur, so that's nothing. 
And I said, excuse me, didn't you just say 90%? Doesn't that mean that 10% can occur elsewhere, like on either side of it? And he said, oh, it almost never happens, so that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> Tenured professor at the University of Michigan, that doesn't even require a statistics course, folks. But really, you do need to learn statistics. And uh, they are doing, in this, in this school in particular, they're doing some fabulous stuff with their statistics. We have a team of statistical geneticists here, second to none. Uh, in the space of the last five or six years, they have reduced the amount of time it takes to do a full genome study by two orders of magnitude. In other words, going from a couple of weeks down to a couple of days to hours. Uh, it's great stuff, and it's statistical technique. It's not developing better machinery. Environmental health sciences. This is the field that is trying to protect us from adverse environmental conditions. And I want to emphasize when I say in here in particular from harmful practices and exposures in air, water, and food in the workplace, home, and ambient environment, there are lots of other things. We have some very good epidemiologists and environmental health scientists in this school who are looking very closely at the effects of heat, heat waves on health particularly heat which gets trapped in a city during the summer. There was a big one in Chicago a few years ago, and quite a few elderly people died as a consequence of it, trying to understand those kinds of patterns. There's going to be all sorts of things associated with global warming over the next several decades that are going to be environmental issues that we're not getting a very good handle on right now, uh, but that's going to fall into the environmental health sciences area. Health behavior and health education. They are addressing the factors associated with health-related behaviors and their influences on health. And they're trying to develop and evaluate educational activities that are designed to improve both individual and community health. Okay, that's a very popular one here. Health management and policy. This department focuses, and indeed the field, focuses on improving access to financing of and delivery of high quality health services and on developing and implementing cost effective public health policies. So in terms of departments, I'm in this department. I don't deal with the healthcare system much. I deal much more with health behavior related policy, environmental health policy. I use the science that goes on in each of those other four departments in my own personal work. And one of the critical elements of public health is the interdigitation among these fields. It is real hard to be really expert and really good in any one of them without working with folks from the others. So separating them in this, in this way is fair in the sense that I'm giving you kind of the five basic fields, but it's also a little misleading because people have to work together. I kind of slipped up a moment ago. I don't know if you all noticed it, but I said I was talking about environmental health sciences and I was talking about heat and, and the issue. And I mentioned we have epidemiologists here as well as environmental health sciences, scientists. And it's true. We have both. We have one very good scientist in the Department of Epidemiology who basically does epidemiology of environmental health science. Actually, we have several people who do that. So those fields are very much interdigitating. <clears throat> 